are you having a bit of a identity crisis where you don't know exactly where you fit into the world at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Cause everyone just kind of gets on with their own lives. I've noticed mm. like, as it's, as I sort of slow down and do nothing, I'm kind of like, Oh, everyone's just getting on with their lives. And it's sort of like, yeah, it's a bit of a funny one. Not yeah. funny, but pretty scary. Yeah. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 248 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. My guest today is Adam Wolfers, a dad, a chef, a cyclist who experienced a stroke caused by cerebral vasculitis. Adam Wolfers, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, man. Thanks for being here. I've got um, I've got awesome family scouting the world, you know, for stroke survivors that I should interview. And a mate of mine, a really good mate of mine, uh, was watching television in Australia here on SBS and was watching a show that you were on. Uh, it was a cooking show with mm -hmm. Adam Liao. And um, after watching the show and hearing your story, he goes, you should reach out to Adam and see if you can get him on the podcast. I thought, all right, no worries. Yeah, nice. So that's exactly what I did. And and you're here. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you, man. So it all started like the start of the uh, whole health scare. It was basically started in um, the start of 2022. So January 2022, I got... Like I was on holidays from work during Christmas period. And that was kind of like when I, um, like a, the COVID scare, the second or third wave happened in up in Queensland and the whole of Australia. And, um, you know, basically I was, you know, there's my background, I'm a chef and I'm, you know, it's a really stressful environment and, um, hardworking and I've always been an overachiever in my entire life, which is, uh, you know, um, sounds like a predicament. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, but basically it all comes down to the start of my, you know, my accident. It sort of started in, um, December, 2022. I had, I got diagnosed with meningitis. Mm. It was like, uh, um the viral brain, meningitis brain yeah. infection yeah yeah so it's like basically the fluid in your spinal like your spinal fluid which goes up into your brain and that basically is like it was I, at the time i didn't know what it was but it was um it came down to having meningitis and um basically the doctors I did all these tests and they, you know, I did a COVID test. And so it was like, it took me about 10 days for them to actually diagnose me with a meningitis. And so I had like severe headaches, um, basically like sensitivity to, to light. And so I basically, at the time, I, you know, it's hard to explain, but I, um, you know, I literally couldn't get out of bed for you know, two weeks. And um, I went to like three different types of hospitals and they basically, you know, they, they were like, oh, you're overworked and, you know, just go away and just gave me a Panadol and just like, oh, yeah. And then basically, basically after about 10 days, I went to my local GP and then he was like, oh, I think you have meningitis. So he did all the tests. That, that was my GP. Um, and um, he did all the tests and he basically sent me to the hospital and, um, you know, I went to the hospital, they do all these tests on me and, you know, I was like, oh, I think you need to do, it's like a thing called a spinal tap. It's like a mm -hmm. lumbar puncture where mm -hmm. they uh, do a, it's not a very pretty, <laughs> pretty. Uh, I've had one. Yeah. Cerebrospinal yeah. fluid test. They, they test a spinal fluid to see what's in it. For me, they were checking for blood, but for you, they were checking for the virus or something else. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so they they did that test, and then basically they they kept me in the hospital for a day because they can't tell you know they do all these tests and scans on it. You can't tell what it is, and for another twenty four hours. So after twenty four hours, they were like, ah, uh, 
you have meningitis. I'm like, oh, okay. That that sort of makes a bit sense, bit of sense. And they were kind of like wondering where I got it from. But uh, you know, at the time I was kind of like, oh, you know, it's just another virus, I'll get over it. And like at the I didn't think anything of it because mm. <laughs> I had no idea about what was going to happen next. And um, so basically I, you know, I took, you know, two, three weeks off work, just calm, like relaxed at home. And um, basically when I got home from the hospital, I literally got COVID like um, two days after coming out of hospital. Right. And I think that's sort of the, the combination of the two, like, cause I, um, I got COVID and COVID was nothing compared to um, meningitis. <laughs> um, and, um, but, you know, I was basically, I, I, I had COVID and I took three weeks off work. And then I basically, you know, slowly went back to work and, um, you know, three months later I had the stroke. Rough trot, man. Yeah. Yeah. So the meningitis is a virus. It says here viral meningitis when the menin when the meningitis is caused by a virus, the most common type of meningitis, um, most people get better on their own without treatment. So is that the idea of sending you home yeah. and just helping you get over it? So it's just affecting your brain. It's affecting how you feel. You're not able to do much, but it generally goes away. Yeah. And are they treating it with medication, anything like that? No, not at the time. They were just kind of like, oh, you know, go home, take a Panderol if it, if it, if it gets worse, but... You know, I didn't, I didn't need that at the time, but, um, okay. So meningitis, you can get by breathing in viral particles that have been sneezed or coughed into the air by another infected person. Mm. It doesn't sound like it's extremely infectious because you don't hear too many cases of viral meningitis, but it's spread the same way that a cold or a flu or COVID is spread. Mm. And you happen to pick that up and then you happen to be at the wrong place at the right time again and you picked up COVID. Yeah. So the how long did COVID put you out of action for? Oh, about a week, I think. Like a, the COVID was nothing compared to meningitis. Yeah. But on top of that, I'm autoimmune as well. Right. So that's yeah. And what autoimmune condition have you got? I have ulcerative colitis. So uh -huh. it's like a Crohn's disease. So yep. Yeah, I was on lots of nasty medications. So I think that's kind of the combination of everything. Me working too hard, um, you know, getting like that meningitis, COVID. And then basically on top of that, I'm writing very, I'm, I'm a very good, like I'm, I'm, I've been cycling very hard, like too much. That's sort of, yeah, it's... You're putting a massive load on your body, basically. Yeah. It's yeah. dealing with um, uh, colitis, ulcerative colitis. It's dealing with recovery from meningitis. It's dealing with recovery from stroke, uh, from COVID. And you're just going full on hammer and tongs. Do you always remember being that busy in your life? Was there ever a moment in your life where you you've been able to do little or nothing and feel like you are actually contributing to your health and well-being no that's the just the, on the go on the go yeah. All the time. yeah yeah that's it because i like i've that's my personality i'm like always trying to strive for the best thing or like always putting 110 percent mm. in everything i do and i think that's sort of the the uh you know it's not the cause but it's um contributing factor to the whole health situation yeah are you a perfectionist is it does it come from something like that yeah i'm a very creative perfectionist so in my work i was kind of like i think sort of high up in my field not high up but like yeah um pretty stressed like it was pretty high up but um, you know, it's it's uh, 
I, I can't really work out what had happened, but right. yeah, it's. And it's at that time in your career, have you got people reporting to you as well? You're not just working yeah. solo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So my, I've always worked in like fine dining restaurants my whole life for mm. 20 years or like 20, 20 odd years as a chef. And I've always sort of tried to over exceed in what I'm doing. Yeah. And yeah. That's, yeah. And there's an upside to that as far as career is concerned. People recognize your ethic, your talent, and mm. the way you go about work. It probably does help with your career, right? Yeah, that's it. Does it interfere with other parts of your life other than your health and well-being? Being that always that prepared to go the extra mile at work? Yeah, I think because um, I have two very young kids. At the time, while I was immersed in my career, my career was always, you know, the number one. Mm. And so number one was my career. Number two was, you know, my family. And so now I'm kind of like, once it's all slowed down, I'm like, oh, wow. The world is basically around me and going along around everything that, that it does. And um, so it's it's been really nice the past, you know, it's been a one year anniversary today from the accident. Wow. Yeah. So, um, but I think I've, you know, I'm still learning to like accept what has happened. Mm. It's, it's going to take a while, but I think um, that's the biggest thing is uh, accept acceptance that they've been, <laughs> everyone's been saying. Uh, but I think, you know, it's been really nice because at the moment I'm basically not working. Yep. I'm, I'm basically in the cross paths at the moment. Um, and, you know, it's been really nice to hang out with the family. So just, you know, seeing the kids go to school, um, cooking at home, all the little things that I never had done before or got mm. the opportunity to do before, I now can enjoy it. But yeah. so then, so then all in, in all that time, so you had meningitis you had COVID and then you had a stroke just after that it, or three did it happen later. three months later that's right so what kind of stroke was it it was a it was a ACA LACA it's kind of like inflammation in the front side of my brain or like uh -huh. the left side yeah so it was like a it wasn't a hemorrhage it was a, a blockage uh -huh. and the doctors at the time they were kind of like they didn't know the exact cause of the stroke because they couldn't read my brain scan because they were like oh this is such a weird brain scan because uh they couldn't give me an exact cause but um yeah like i have yeah yeah so they called it cerebral vascular cerebral vasculitis and it presents as a stroke so something happens to the to the blood vessels and then as a result of that, it stops the blood vessel from being able to send blood through it, mm. and it perhaps narrows in size, and then as a result of that, causes a a stroke by a blockage that's not a blood clot, right? Mm. Was yeah, a, I don't know if I have like they sort of said it was vasculitis. Yeah, but, but um, I have one of my luckily. You know, the guys that I ride with, they're kind of like um, in the medical field. Uh -huh. And one of the guys is, a, um, I wrote this down. It's like a, a brain, you know, cancer specialist. So uh -huh. he basically really fine. He can look at a scan and be like, oh, I know the, like there's information there. And so I, I basically saw my neurologist and he was like, oh, I can't tell you exactly, you know, whether you can have another stroke or not. And I was just kind of wanted answers, mm. as we all do. Yeah. And um, I got my my um, my friend in my cycling group. He's um, I forget. I've just written this down here. Um, he's basically a hang on a neuro. Where is it?
anyway, so yeah. <laughs> in the neuro, neuro field. Yeah. And uh, he basically said, he said to me, oh, like, I don't think the neurologist can read your scan properly. Right. Because it's really difficult for a, a public hospital um, intern to read that sort of scan. So yeah, okay. But, yeah, so, I didn't so, explain that properly. <laughs> yeah. No, you explained it well, man. So I understand. So basically, what where you're at is this, you're in a little bit of a sort of zone where you're not exactly certain what's happened, how it's happened, and whether it's possible for it to happen again. Yeah, seems to be like a inconclusive stage of the yeah. diagnosis and they're not really sure what yeah. what caused it okay so you, you you're still in that process though of being in touch with doctors regularly and seeing people regularly about this yeah uh no they just 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 discharged me from the hospital huh. and they're kind of like you're on your own now how does that feel i mean it's okay. I was sort of, you know, you got to get on with your life. But at the mm. same time, I'm kind of like always at the back of my head. I'm like, am I going to have another stroke? Mm. That's the scariest thing. Mm. So, but, you know, I've, you know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty scary. <laughs> what I would encourage you to do. Yeah. Not that you joined, joined come along to this podcast specifically to get advice from me, but yeah. what I would encourage you to do is find another neurologist and get to the bottom of this. Use your friend, your cycling mate, mm. to get you into, or whether it's he or somebody else, to get you into uh, the office of somebody that's going to be able to take you through the whole, the whole thing and give you some sort of a path forward so you know what's going to happen mm. uh, and how they're going to monitor your condition. Mm. Is there somebody monitoring your condition in any way? Uh, so I have a... I have a um a well-rounded GP that she sort of looks at the whole gut biome and she's keeping an eye on all my bloods and um yeah, I haven't really got anyone <laughs> for the yeah, for the head the stroke side of things yet. Yeah, definitely definitely do that, man. And it sounds like in order are you writing things down because you're trying to remember them and memory is a bit of an issue? Is that why you've had things written down? Yeah. So have you spoken to anyone about your deficits and the things that you're experienced as a result of the stroke that has made you feel a little differently than you were before? Yeah, I can kind of tell that it's a little bit of a delay in my, mm -hmm. like he, they diagnosed me with like mild aphasia mm -hmm. and a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always got like that, I, I sort of feel that delay. I can't like, Mm -hmm. straight away answer the questions really quickly i have to have a think about it and then it's sort of on the spot thinking that's the hardest thing for me mm. and that's you know it's gotten better but it's you know it's one of those things that's going to take time i think that's yeah. that's what i'm thinking <laughs> yeah it will and also yeah. also rehab adam have you had yeah. any one take you through speech therapy or yeah. try to determine where where your deficits are and how to improve them yeah so i had intensive rehab for the first three months uh -huh. and um so once that was done um i've just sort of gotten back to work and just chatting to people that's sort of my way of mm -hmm. okay, recovery so but, yep. yeah and how how much work have you got back to? Because if you were a chef, I imagine you were doing crazy hours. Yeah. So what's it like now when you're back at work? How many hours are you doing? Uh, so I, I, at the time, I was kind of like I needed to get back to work straight away. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I think I went back too soon, looking back on it. But my, you know, it's not... I really want to get back into the industry, but I feel like in restaurants, it's not really where I can thrive. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sort of looking at like consultancy and, you know, basically writing menus for other restaurants. And, you know, I'm just sort of hanging in there, <laughs> finding ways to um, make Brilliant. money. 
Yeah. 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 But has it been one of the hardest things being unable to work? Yeah. Yeah. But you're at home with the kids and your wife mm. and you've got a little bit more time to do that. Is that special? How does that feel being able to actually spend some time with the young kids and your wife? Yeah, it's been great. It's been amazing. But um, I'm kind of like at a point in my life where I'm like in a crossroads. So it's mm. kind of like stroke recovery, midlife crisis at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stroke yeah. tends to do that to you, man. How old are you? Um, 39. Yeah. yeah. That's a perfect time for a midlife crisis. Don't... <laughs> yeah. Never mind. And 20 years of solid work in an industry. Mm. Um, I get it how you feel like the whole industry, the whole thing you've done is like really big part of your identity. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Are you having a bit of a identity crisis where you don't know exactly where you fit into the world at the moment? Cause everyone just kind of gets on with their own lives. I've noticed mm. like, as it's, as I sort of slow down and do nothing, I'm kind of like, Oh, everyone's just getting on with their lives. And it's sort of like, yeah, it's a bit of a funny one. Not yeah. funny, but pretty scary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone gets on, on with their lives because life doesn't stop around you after a stroke happens. That's the weird thing. Like, I went through it for three years before I was, before I had brain surgery and then was still on the mend for another one or two years after that properly. And my whole situation started in 2012 and then it, I didn't get back to work until 2019. Now, I was working, but not in an industry that I wanted to work in, not doing the kind of work I wanted to do. I was doing just a basic job in an office so that I could actually have a job to go to. And mm. I, very, I wasn't very good at it, but I worked mm. with with a mate of mine who was my general manager who really turned the blind eye and protected me for about three years. Mm. Um, even though I was participating at work and I was trying to do my best, I wasn't up to the task at all. Um, so yeah, there's a massive identity crisis when I felt like I was in a bit of a limbo and trying to work out where to from here and trying to find things to occupy my time with. And what I found was doing things that I enjoyed that were hobbies filled that gap a little bit because mm. it was able to bring me a bit of joy. And then from there, um, as I did that, it kind of filled my, filled my bucket a little bit and then kind of made everything else that was happening around me not so bad, even though it was tough time. Uh, but my wife had to go back to work full time, uh, go back to work as per normal because she had to bring in the majority of the money at that time. Mm. My kids went back to their life as per normal because they were teenagers. So they didn't really give a shit about anybody. Mm. And fair enough. And then um, everyone else sort of goes back to their normal life because normal life continues. The bills need to be paid, you know, work deadlines, school, all that kind of stuff. It, it, it all has to happen. So they do that and they do that not knowing what you're going through because they can't really understand what's happening on the inside of you after a stroke. Like they they can't actually get it because they've never been there. You never want them to get it. And then you're the person who's stuck there and you're, you have to take responsibility 
while you're recovering from stroke and all the other stuff you've been through, you got to retake, take responsibility for redirecting your life in a way that's going to move you forward. That's going to make you feel good about it. And this time of resting is really about actually resting and getting better and recovering because stroke recovery doesn't take three months. Sometimes it doesn't take six months. Sometimes it doesn't take six years. Sometimes it takes longer. And I feel like I'm still recovering, even though I'm back to quote unquote normal life. I still like, I'm, I, I still feel like I'm recovering every day. Nothing's really, it's never out of my mind. And, and at the beginning, it was maybe in my mind in a, in a way that was stressful and that, but now it's in my mind of like, I've got to take care of myself more than anything else. And I've got to pay attention to my body. And if it tells me to rest and sleep, I've got to go and rest and sleep. And if it's telling me I've taken on too much this week, I've got to take on less next week and remember the lesson and try not to put myself in a situation where things aren't, um, where I, where, where I put myself back in the state I was in before stroke, you know, that state where you're doing too much and you're crazy and lots of hours and you're over, over delivering for everybody except yourself. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very normal what you're going through. Although it, it sounds like it's uncomfortable for you. Yeah. Just got to get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what's the hardest thing for you to go through to experience in this time? Is it just, is it actually the strike or is it the shift in your identity? Is it, how do you kind of define what the hardest part is for you? Uh, I think it's, it's a, it's at the point where at the moment I'm not working. So I'm kind of like finding ways to make, cause my wife, she kind of, she doesn't really want to work full time, yeah. which is the hardest thing. And I, at the, at the time I was like relying on uh, my pay as the full income for the family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the scariest thing is like, what, what am I going to, I'm just kind of just doing gig, little gig after gig just to tie it over. We're not looking to save money or, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, it's just, I, I'm not too sure when it's going to, if it's going to get better. That's the whole un, uncertainty. Yeah, it, it does. And it probably will. Mm. Uh, but what you're talking about is kind of just breaking even at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is something that we did for a long time as well. Yeah. We had to break even for about, you know, five, six years. Mm. And my wife was working main, main breadwinner, but again, earning, working three days a week. Yeah. And I was trying to squeeze in some work here or there, whatever I could do to just cover my my outgoings but it was really hard and that's mm -hmm. why i went and got just a really crappy full-time office job where i didn't really care about it but i filled the role and made some money and felt like i had somewhere to go every day mm -hmm. but I, but at the beginning for about a year and a half i had a lot of time to myself a lot of downtime where there wasn't much to do anywhere other than doctor's appointments mm -hmm. Are you okay with being with yourself? I was quite okay being at home alone with my own self, but are you all right hanging out with yourself? Yeah, I'm kind of like, I don't, I can't get, like I'm a bit more of a creative mind. Mm -hmm. So I get really, I always look for the next best thing. I can't like sit still. Um, that's my personality. Mm -hmm. So that's, been really hard for me because I, you know, I've just basically that like I I can rest, but at the same time I can't rest because my mind's just ticking over what am I going to do next? That's the yeah. 
And does that mean you start a lot of things, but don't see them through or, or just jump onto the next shiny thing that comes along? Or do you normally start a project and see it through and get it to the end and then start another? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because all the places I've worked, I've worked for like five years, five years, five years, five years. Okay. Not like six months here, six months there. Like, yeah, but that's the, yeah. I. Yeah, it's just, you you know what, what it's like. I just can't really explain what's going on in my head. But yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, you managed to get on TV and... Um, yeah do this cooking show with Adam Liao. So how, did, yeah. how does that come about? So basically that happened about five months after my accident. So at that time, they contacted me via the restaurant. They're like, oh, you want to come on the Adam Liao show? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can do that. And at the time, they were kind of like, oh, you need to do x amount of recipes and you know like it it's for a, a normal person it was very stressful but for a stroke recently stroke patient it was like so uh, like hectic for me like all the all the lights and the cameras in your face and right. they basically were like um okay this take here you like you need to do this, 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 this. And my memory at the time, I couldn't even remember, you know, having my phone next to me, you know, for the five seconds before. And I was like, oh, and I was just getting really flustered. And they kind of were like, they were really nice, but, you know, they didn't understand what was going in my head. Because yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty hectic that, kind of thing because they're you know you have like you need to write out your recipes you have all the recipes ready and they have all the food laid out for you and then I sort of said to them oh you need to have you know this food all prepped for me so I can basically plate it up and send it like plate it up for the cameras like it was it was <laughs> oh like it was so stressful <laughs> Yeah. I can't even explain how hectic it was, but yeah. So your how long was the the filming for? How long did the it filming take? Filming was film? for like eight hours. And that was like a thirty, hour day. 30 eight, minute episode, right? Thirty minute episode. So there were three episodes in in the day. So they did. They have two more episodes after that one. So they had like a um, chili garlic eggplant and a, a 15 minute meal so there's another two episodes to come uh on the tv so i did three full episodes in one day which took from you know five in the morning through till 5 p.m that day wow yeah and of course that that's not normal for a normal human being that's hard to do for anybody <laughs> yeah. right and when you've had a stroke it's like even harder yeah, that's it. Yeah, because they were like, oh, we have a, a quiet room you can go in. And their quiet room was like really bright lights and like Nothing it was quiet not quiet it. at all. It was like, all, <laughs> hey, <laughs> it was like the complete opposite of quiet. And um, I was, I like literally had to take my pair of sunnies and my, um, those like AirPods and put them in. And I was like, you know, putting on easy listening music. And I just was like, you know, I had a break for about half an hour and I was just like, okay, I'm good to go. And then <laughs> it was like, it's, yeah, it was, it was so hard. Did they know that you had had a stroke? Yeah. Okay. So they knew that, but yeah. you don't look like somebody who had a stroke yeah. technically, right? You look, yeah. I look normal. <laughs> you look normal, right? Yeah. So that would have been hard for them to comprehend. Yeah. And kind of work out like this guy looks fine i don't know what he's talking about you know yeah. um, it just seems li really difficult to work with because he wants all this stuff that other people don't want yeah. and that would have been difficult in a 12-hour day for them that would have been hard to sort of deal with somebody who's different in any way yeah yeah that's it yeah and then and then you get through that and how are you the next day 
How do you feel after you've done that? Are you wiped out? Are you wasted? Oh, because you have to. So I live in Brisbane. So from Brisbane, you have to fly down to Sydney. And oh. so that alone, I needed like two days to recover from a flight. Right. <laughs> so you fly down. So that was my first flight since that accident. I was like, oh my God, this is so intense. Like it's intense for anyone, but. Um, you know, you get it. <laughs> yeah. um, and basically, I went down on my own, um, on the plane on my own. And I I got like, I got picked up from my, because my parents live in Sydney. So they picked me up from the airport and just, you know, took me to the hotel room. And I just stayed in the hotel room uh, for about, you know, I stayed in there for that whole, a whole day. And then the next day uh, was the filming. So I, I literally flew down on the Friday, or on the Thursday, Friday, Thursday morning, got there Thursday after an hour or Thursday, 10 o'clock. And then basically went to the hotel room, stayed in the hotel room and just slept for, you know, eight hours. And then I, I basically wrote down all the, um, all my answers because I asked them, you know, what questions are you going to ask? I'll practice that all. And so I was reading all the, all the lines before I'm going on. I'm like, oh man, this is so hard. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, you know, I just basically memorized all the lines. And then when I got to the filming of it, um they were kind of like they changed the way they asked the questions and so like you, you saw what it was it was like sitting on a stool talking to adam lau and then another um yes. montaigne who's like a a uh, personality and they all sat there like it was really awkward it was kind of like sitting up straight like this and i was really concentrating on what i'm where, like I was da daunting on the fact of him asking me a question and I was like okay he's gonna ask me this question okay and then I'll memorize it and then just change the way he asked the question slightly and then I was just froze and I was like oh my god okay just just say uh I just say a word I'm like okay just say that word and then, and then I you know it was just it was really Yes, it was so hard. <laughs> yeah. So, so did you watch the episodes back? Did you have a look and see? No, I can't. You watch did it. it. No. Right. It's <laughs> interesting because I watched, I watched the episode, contacted you straight away after I saw it, and um, of course, the person who told me to watch the episode told me that you'd had a stroke. You're a stroke survivor, mm. and of course, then I'm picking up all of the challenges that you're going through and I can tell that you're going through a lot of challenges trying to get the words out and you what you mentioned a bit earlier about the aphasia the little bit of aphasia yeah. that you have like getting started in answering your question yeah and I think they did a really terrible job in uh presenting you in the editing presenting you as good as possible not that they should have edited that I'm not saying that at all I'm just joking right yeah. but you could I could tell that you're definitely still in stroke in the phase of stroke where your recovery uh, is still coming along and you've got a little bit of recovery to do. Do you have any, are you happy that you went along and did that anyway and sort of pushed through all those challenges or do you feel like it would have been better to just sit it out? Um, I think at the time I was like, oh, this opportunity isn't going to come later that was my whole thought process in my head and you know I don't regret doing it but I think at the time I went I feel like if I left it another six months it would make it a lot easier for me yeah I think right. yeah that's you know you can say I oh, you, you know you should have waited like or if you waited the opportunity may not have been there. Yeah. That's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Okay. I, I tend to agree with you. Just go for it and do whatever you can and get through it. Yeah. I remember early on in 
my stroke recovery, I got approached by the Stroke Foundation to do some TV as well, some media. Mm. And they came to our house and they filmed for about 12 hours. And there was about 50 people in my house. My, I got a little house and they were everywhere. And um, we were doing some ads for Bupa, the uh, insurer, mm. and um, and the Stroke Foundation. They were working together. And it was chaos, absolutely chaos. Um and I remember being in my own house and not eating and not drinking anything, just getting sucked into the whole production mm. and waiting. For, like I had food in my fridge and everything, but waiting for catering to bring us the food and all that type of thing. It was so <laughs> weird. Yeah. Um, and we managed to get it done and got through it. And it was hard, but it was really rewarding. I felt really good about having been involved. And like you, I thought, this opportunity won't come again. Mm. Um, and it was just, what the hell is just go for it and do it. And then, um, and then do the recovery later and deal with it. Was it helpful having your mum and dad in Sydney with you? Did you catch up with them after the show again? Yeah. Or did you just yeah. fly straight home? No, so I caught up with mum and dad while I was down there. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah. It was, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting journey. Was that the first time you had the opportunity to be on TV? Yep. Yeah, I get you. You got to do it and you got to push through it. And even though it's hard and you suffer while you're there, if you can get through it, like you said, with shades and, you know, with your AirPods, just yeah. trying to keep the noises out and all that and somehow push through for a day or so and it's not going to impact you your health in a negative way mm. i think there's a lot of positives that come out of it so it's kind of like worth paying that price a little bit to get this experience yeah yeah true so i, I think I, I know the i think i've got a new career for you if uh <laughs> if you're up for a career advice um youtube channel man where you're cooking meals at home yeah just do that. Teach people how to cook, uh, but um, bacon and eggs or whatever they need to eat to get through, you know, stroke recovery. That's easier to make. You know, you can be the uh, stroke recovery chef guy. <laughs> How's that for a channel? Yeah, a channel yeah, name. That's a good channel. <laughs> yeah. um, I say that because there's a, a lot of cool creative people on Instagram. One of them is a lady who I follow uh, who uh, has a page called georgia bakes for brains and um she's had a stroke she's uh somebody who had a craniotomy so part of a skull removed and then i imagine uh re had it put back she lives in melbourne and um her insta is um georgia bakes for brains and then she's just got all of the creations that she's ever put together um and she must make cakes for people. I imagine she makes cakes for birthdays, that type of thing. Yeah. She's super creative and she just takes you on a very quick little journey of uh, decorating a cake. Uh, and I think for a lot of people that, that can tend to be kind of therapeutic, watching somebody, uh, sort of being somebody who has got the skills that you've got that might be therapeutic and help you sort of feel like your identity is still alive and well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a great idea. I just, yeah, I, I'm kind of at the moment, I'm kind of, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. I hear you, man. I know. I'm not <laughs> expecting you to be a um, YouTube chef tomorrow. <laughs> But I thought I'd just chuck it out there. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's yeah. it's if it doesn't, it doesn't. It's all right. <laughs> so, what's it like dealing with the kids, man? Are they little? Yeah. So, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. So that was pretty tough because, mm. um, you know, the for the first six months, I was like, I didn't quite understand the whole oversensory overload sort of thing. And so they're screaming and, you know, carrying on. They don't, you know, they're, they're little, they don't understand that, like, daddy looks normal. Um, and 
at the time, you know, I wanted to be with them, but like I couldn't because I literally the noise and the screaming and the carrying on, I couldn't handle it. Yeah. And um, you know, I got I got better at it. I got those AirPods and just put on nice calming music in the morning, put my sunnies on and cooked breakfast and that that got through it. Wow. Yeah. So that was a way of getting through it. <laughs> um, but you know, it was it was it's it's really good now. Yeah. Yeah, it's much better now. Yeah. Kids don't really care what's happening yeah. to you. They're just <laughs> gonna be themselves, right? Yeah, that's it. And it's kind of good, but at the same time, it's kind of really hard. And it's mm. little kids require a lot of energy. Um, and they just expect you to turn up and be there for them and do everything you've always done. Mm. That's it. They don't really mind. Um, so cooking in the morning with sunnies and AirPods on, yeah? Yeah. Is the morning the hardest part of the day for you? Is it the... And you live in sunny Queensland, so it's yeah. bright all the time. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. is that the hardest part of the day for you? Or is there other parts of the day where it feels a bit harder? I think the morning is probably the easiest part of the day. Okay. Because um, it's hard to explain, but like in Queensland, everyone's up at 5 a.m. And so everyone's doing things from 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And so that's sort of that's sort of easier for me because I have like two young kids and they're up at five o'clock already. So that's been my morning thing. Yep. And, um, but I find like, as I get to about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, I then start to get really lethargic and just need to lie down for half an hour and then I'm good to go. Yeah. Yep. Recharge. Recharge. About yeah. Two or three in the afternoon. So yeah. how does the lethargy, come about do you notice that your talking suffers do you notice that other things sort of get a little bit strokey do you have like the symptoms get worse yeah, or i think the, like because i like my right side got affected and so i find that like when i my my right side of my body like basically becomes a lot weaker and i can't use it as well and that's sort of the first point of um part of my body that is um you know noticeable yeah and it's telling you you're tired and you need a rest yeah bit of a cat nap and then you're up yeah <laughs> and you're sleeping all right you're getting through the night with a decent amount of sleep waking up feeling like you've had a good amount of sleep yeah i do now yeah so for a while there i was like literally teaching myself how to sleep and then so that was that was the hardest thing is like teaching yourself how to sleep again and that was you know it was so easy for me to sleep because i basically did a lot during the day go to bed and wake up you know the next day and so i had to reteach myself how to sleep so you know um using meditation and mm. you know using those airpods just before i go to sleep deep breathing i just had to reteach myself how to do all that stuff so what sort of hours were you keeping as a chef were you up at the crack of dawn or were you going home really late at night or were you doing both so i was so to mention before i was a cyclist so i was up at about 4 a.m uh-huh and then i cycled you know two three hours in the morning then i'd come home make breakfast for the kids and then I just, you know, relax for about an hour and I go into work at 10 o'clock. And so 10 o'clock till midnight. Wow. And then I, I'd only cycle once every two days, but I think that was an ongoing thing to basically. So up at four yeah. and then you finish at midnight. Yeah. And then you go home. How long does it take you to get home and then fall asleep? What, you're getting three oh, hours a night? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're back in 15 minutes and then you're having a shower, winding down, and you're getting three hours a night of sleep some nights? Sometimes, yeah. And it's still feeling 100% good to go the next morning? Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's, that's probably 
too much. Yeah, <laughs> that's too much for anybody, of course. Yeah. But what's interesting is that you got to do it for that long for such a long time. Was that something that you were doing for many, many years? Uh, I was doing that for about two, three years. Three years, yeah. Did you feel that it was good for you while you were doing yes. it? Yeah. Okay. Amazing. That was my happy place, my cycling. So right. that was my outlet. outlet. And you just somehow... And when had I to... got taken away, that was like, I felt really lost. Have you been able to cycle since? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so you're so, back on the bike? Yeah, so literally... Six weeks out of hospital, I have like a, a one of those um, Wahoo trainers. Yeah. I was on the trainer, like six weeks out of hospital. I could only do like, you know, 10 minutes and then I'd do 20 minutes and I'd do 30 minutes. And I sort of like incrementally do that over the course of, you know, like after about 12 weeks out of hospital, I was riding 40 Ks. That's pretty good, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, at the around. time I was kind of like, I want to get back to what I was before. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've kind of realized let that it, I can't. Hey. You've let it go a little. You've let yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's hard. So now how many kilometers are you doing on your, uh, 40 kilometers is 26 mile for anyone yeah. wondering somewhere there. Mm. So how many kilometers are you doing now? Uh, so I'm doing, I can only do 40 Ks. So I can only do 40 kilometers at a time. Only. <laughs> but I can only do that once or twice a week now. Yeah. One, right. one to two times a week. But after a ride, like I'm basically done for half the day. You're wiped before. out. Yeah, wiped out. Yeah. Yep. I remember the, that. Yeah. I remember that because I used to... I, I don't have those issues that you had about cycling. I don't need to do a thousand kilometers a, a week. <laughs> so I just used to run. I just used to ride just as a different way to get to a destination without walking or driving. Yeah. Right. That was all. And, and just really leisurely. I've even got a little speaker that I, that I um, cable tie to the back of my uh, seat underneath my seat. And I just put the iTunes on or, oh, yeah. or Spotify on and I just blare out, um, dance music as I'm as I'm riding along the, <laughs> the bike paths right it's so yeah. cool yeah so that's that's why I did it and then when I when I couldn't get back on the bike again I was really devastated as well mm. because when I did get on the bike my left side got tired far quicker than my right side and it fatigued immediately and then I couldn't feel my arm and leg and my leg would fall off the pedal and then putting my leg down my left leg down to balance I wouldn't feel my leg so I'd fall off the bike mm. It was just a nightmare. So I stopped riding and then I found an electric bike. So battery operated, um, it helps you with the pedaling. That made a massive difference to how much fatigue my, my leg and my arm felt. And I was mm. able to ride for longer. So now I might do 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers in a ride. And yeah. that could take hours. It's not going to, I don't need, I don't need to do it fast. I just need to get it done. Right. Mm. So that was what was really cool about it. And then I got to the point of once I had managed to find the electric bike and get on that, I got to the point where that fatigue of I did a 20 kilometer ride in the morning and now I'm wiped out for the rest of the day. That started to shrink that I got, I was later than I wasn't wiped out for the whole day. I was wiped out for three quarters of the day and then for half the day and then for a little bit of time and then for half an hour or an hour. So right now, if I go for a ride, then I just take a rest for an hour or two, and I'm yeah. really, I'm really good after it. Mm. But that that's what gets better. And I feel the more you exercise, it is really beneficial to you. So it's definitely worth doing. But over exercising is something that you've got to be careful about. And I'm glad that you're at that stage where you've realised that I'll still enjoy my ride, but only twice a week, and um, and then I'll I'll rest. Mm. Yeah. And are you still waking up at four in the morning to do that ride? Oh, no, no. It's like um, I'll go about 5 a.m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just, it's hard, it's hard to explain, but like in Queensland, you kind of go earlier because it yep. gets really hot by about seven o'clock. Right. 
by 7 a.m it start like it gets like the humidity is very different up here right so all the everyone is out and about all the cyclists are out at five in the morning 5 30 so but um yeah i think yeah i can you know i'm really grateful that i can ride my bike that's that's the most important thing yeah. and um yeah i'm not i'm not doing it for a job i'm doing it as a like enjoyment now yeah yeah have you so now it's now it's about enjoyment and supporting your recovery and it's about healthy for healthy reasons yeah. it's probably taking you into the same quiet space you're still going into that same quiet space helping you out with your mental well-being i imagine yeah it does definitely were you the kind of guy to seek out help when you were going through a tough time or struggling before stroke were you that type of guy did you need guidance and support from other people were you just able to push through no i was just able to push through yeah so changed a little bit now have you been able to um i think it's pretty much the same like but you know it's yeah it's just different mm. it's just like i don't i don't yeah i'm kind of like i feel that i'm different but I don't want to be different. That's sort of where I'm at. Uh -huh. So part of you is going, let's hold on to the old Adam. Yeah. And the other parts are going, there's definitely a new Adam. Mm. And is it about transitioning and trying to embrace the new Adam at some stage and trying to yeah. feel comfortable with that? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Stroke tends to do that really rapidly. Aging does that a little bit slower. It gives you a little bit more time to go, oh, shit, I noticed that ache ache in my back That's i'm easy. going to take it easy or oh my toe hurts or uh i'm not as fit as i used to be mm. you have a gradual kind of understanding of how you're changing and how you need to adapt to go mm. go through life but stroke just does it overnight mm. big difference yeah and that's the hardest part for people to adjust to a lot of people can't adjust to that change that happens so rapidly because they're caught up in you know, three minutes ago i was all these other things i i was a chef who worked 14 hours a day i was a dad i was a cyclist i did all these things and now what overnight i'm i'm not all those things anymore what what am i what do i do how do i get along mm -hmm. If anyone finds themselves in that situation though what i do is try and encourage them to just be in that space so in the space of your lifetime you've gone through about 40 years of life and then in in the space of 40 years this time this one year even if it's two years of time where you're not sh sure or certain about things it's not a long amount of time while you're in it it feels long the reality is it's not long it's a very short amount of time and it's going to go really fast um and you'll get through it and, and and it's you've got to find a unique way that supports your thinking and supports the way you'd like to go about life to get through it in your own unique way that's that's the challenging part it's like how do you adapt and and change it sometimes reaching out to other people can help you with that you know, counseling coaching uh mentor anyone who understands your condition and what you've been through could sort of help that and make it make the transition a little easier perhaps or perhaps not no doesn't, i'm agreeing with you <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter it doesn't matter yeah um how does talking for a long time impact you and going through a conversation like this does that make you tired fatigued um it gets me like i can talk for about you know 30 40 minutes and then i start to get really lethargic right, like okay. i am right now yeah yeah i noticed <laughs> i picked it up that's why i asked <laughs> yeah and, and I, okay, it's was, gotten better because for the first you know two three months like oh six months seven months i like literally had a conversation with for 10 minutes and i'll be like 
I'm done. And yeah. so it's gotten much better. I couldn't have done this like three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what, man? On that note, though, yeah. I'm going to let you get back yeah. to the rest of your day. Okay. I really appreciate you saying yes and coming onto the podcast when I reached out. I love what you're doing as far as still trying to get through this and adjusting and finding new ways to do yourself. And um, if you ever decide to do the uh, food YouTube channel, I'll come, I'll fly to I'll fly to Brisbane and you can uh, I can be your guest on your show and you can show me how to um how to prepare a meal. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for having me on the show. My pleasure, mate. Thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to try the course Five Foods to Avoid After Stroke, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash courses and get on board now. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is leave the show a five-star review and a few words about what it means to you. The more comments that we get, the more reviews that we get, the more popular the show will become, and that will make it possible for other people who are going through what you're going through to find it, and that will hopefully make it better for them. If you remember what it was like when you found the podcast and what a difference it made to you, well, hopefully what we're going to do is make it possible for other people to find the podcast as well. And have a better stroke recovery. Now, if you're a short, if you're a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor or care for someone who is a stroke survivor or be one of the fabulous people who work in the field that help stroke survivors. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the contact form. And as soon as I receive your request, I'll respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you and me to meet over Zoom. Thanks again for being here and listening. As my voice goes croaky, I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.